This is a little fact-finding presentation here. This is a sort of a principles of diagnosis thing. I used to run this for my students here. And it makes a lot of sense to have a, an attack plan if you're going to successfully figure out what's wrong with something. And so, you know, there's one guy uh, that, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say one guy. There's a heck of a lot of people out there uh, that, my, you know, a buddy that I knew really well worked at a parts store. And he said uh, working at a parts store for a little while taught him a heck of a lot because he says he's, he saw a lot of people that didn't know very much of anything. And he said that some of them, all they knew how to do was have the battery checked and to replace the alternator whenever the car had a problem. But anyway, a lot of those people could tell stories about folks they've seen that have done things that they shouldn't have done. Uh, you know, and sometimes people tinker with their vehicles and they get, they make problems for themselves that weren't there, that wouldn't have been there if they'd have left them alone. You know, I've seen that a few times too, you know. You'd have to go back in there behind them and undo everything that they did and so on and so forth. But the reality of whatever it is that we're investigating is hidden from us. It's basically something we have got to go looking for. If it wasn't hidden, we wouldn't need to investigate it. So basically, whenever we find out what the symptom is, we have to determine. Uh, and sometimes it's pretty straightforward. You know, like for example, if somebody comes in and says, hey, my car loses power, and you drive it and you stand on the accelerator, you know, and to, you know, like you're accelerating into traffic and it loses power, the first place you look is fuel, fuel pressure or a fuel filter. And, you know, you, you can kind of do that if you know a little something about what's going on to begin with. Uh, but as complicated as cars are now, you know, it's, it's get, it gets a little tougher and it requires other tools like that we didn't that we didn't used to have to use. Now there are some times when we've seen a problem enough or a similar problem that we know what the problem is. My friend Alan told me his fuel gauge wasn't working right. He's only got two thousand seven silver Silverado. And so he said, well, my fuel gauge is working. I said, most likely you've got this. Now a lot of those uh, mid-2000s vintage, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, will have stepper motors that are bad behind the instrument cluster. He didn't have that problem. He just had one issue with his fuel gauge that wasn't reading right. These like to wear out. There's supposed to be two of these here and they're supposed to be sliding on there and his had worn out to the point and then it dumped one of these and his gauge just wasn't working right at all. But this business of having seen it before is okay, but it's not the end-all be-all. Uh, there was a friend of mine that I worked with for years over there and I had basically done some of his training and he was a fairly intelligent guy and he was excellent at remembering what he had done to fix other vehicles but it went, and it came, when, when there was one that came that he had not seen before he ran into a problem and he couldn't figure out sometimes what was going on. And sometimes if you were telling him to do, you know, you need to check this or that, if it was something that he felt like was a lot of trouble, he wouldn't check that because he would think it was too much trouble. And then when he finally did check it, he'd find out that's what was wrong with it. Uh, and I could tell some stories about that. But one way or another, this was a good call. So we popped a gauge, we popped a sending unit in there, which was about 145 bucks just for the sending unit. We didn't replace the whole pump. Now to find the truth, the investigator, if it's if you're the investigator, needs to gather and analyze data so the investigation leads us to the correct conclusion. Uh, now we need to know enough basics so we'll know what information we need to gather and we need to know how to gather the information the right way and we need to know how to interpret the data once we have gathered it. I'm going to start out here. This whole week we gathered data by physically looking for the leak. And we found a sending unit leaking right here. Most of it coming from the sending unit. The car still goes low on engine oil with no remaining external leak. So it has to be going out the tailpipe. In other words, it wasn't even making a drop on the pavement after we replaced this. But it was still using oil. It wasn't smoking, but that didn't mean it's not using oil. So she kept having to add oil to it, you know, like in the court every couple of weeks or whatever. Now, believe it or not, both Ford and GM for years had a rule that said if one is burning a quart every thousand miles, that's not too much and we're not going to fix that under warranty. That's both Ford and GM. All right, so on this same car, we replaced a whiny power steering pump. Now, like I say, if a power steering pump goes low on fluid too many times, you're going to destroy the pump because it's going to be worn out on the inside. No matter how much fluid you put in it or how well you bleed it, it's still going to whine. 
But this one here, we replaced the pump, and she initially had good steering, but the problem returned because the belt was stretched and wouldn't tighten, so we had to get a different belt and put on there. The crazy thing about some of the aftermarket belts, I like to go with OEM belts or a really good name like Gates or something, because uh, some of these belts, if you've got the, if you don't have the spring-loaded tensioners, if you've just got the tensioner where you you got to loosen it like this one, where you got to loosen it up and tighten it, you know, by putting your breaker bar in there or whatever. The belt will stretch a little bit, and then it will start slipping, and then you'll have to tighten it again. When I had my Jeep Cherokee, I put an aftermarket belt on it. I don't remember the name brand, uh, but I had to tighten that thing about five or six times over a period of a couple of months of driving because it kept stretching and getting loose and squealing again. Uh, before I had that Jeep, I was driving for a while a... Uh, Nissan Sentra and had the same kind of problem with that and it did not have spring loaded tensioners It had the ones you had to tighten up, you know, and if you got the belt you got to tighten it, you might think you got it tight enough Because uh, you don't want to over tighten it, especially if it's got those draw bolts that pull the component up there to tighten it Because if you over tighten it, you'll destroy bearings and other things. So you have to really really be careful about that and, uh, all right, Let me do something right here that I need to do uh, not as I need to make sure I got my phone plugged in because I don't want it going dead on me. All right. Now, lack of power on a V6 Monte Carlo after we checked for fuel and air filter issues, we for exhaust back pressure we checked, we replaced the catalyst. Now, what the deal is, uh, I, I, this was a little trick that the muffler shops do. You drill a hole right in front of the catalytic converter, take one of the plain old vacuum fuel pressure gauge, you know, it reads plenty of pressure on that side. Hold it up against there. You not, ought not have any pressure at all right there. If you've got any pressure here, uh, even a couple of pounds, that's just that's bordering on too much. If you've got five pounds, that is too much. This one pegged the needle. The crazy thing was, we actually had done a temperature gun check on this, and it lied to us. So if you do it, that's not a go no go test. If you do a temperature gun test before and after the converter, see that. It shouldn't be hotter going into the converter than it is coming out, but now if the, the closer the converter is to the engine, the more likely you are to read one. This may seem like it's hotter going in because coming right out of the engine, the exhaust is going to be really hot anyway. Um, but this vermiculite stuff gets breaks loose from around the brick and clogs that doggone thing up. The only way you can fix that, uh, the only legitimate way you can fix that is to replace it. All right. Now, like I say, temperature measurements aren't always reliable. You can also take a vacuum gauge and connect it to the uh, intake manifold and rev it up and hold it. You know, when you snap your throttle up without a load and hold it, that needle ought to drop and then come right back up. But if it drops and stays down and the engine doesn't have a, a load on it, like, if, you know, obviously if, you, if you're brake torquing it, if you put it in gear uh, and you uh, give it the gas and hold it there, it's going to stay down. Well, Having an exhaust that's partially clogged up will act like it's an engine load because it's trying to push it through, push the exhaust out of there and it can't get it out of there. A go-no-go -go test is best if you can come up with one. Some tests are only valid at pinpointing issues if the test fails. This Using your um, diode test on your meter, you put this on diode check and you go from here to the frame and then you flip them around if it reads one day, don't pay attention to the numbers other than the fact that it ought to read one way and not the other. That's pretty, it's pretty important to note that. However, even if it passes this test, that doesn't mean the alternator is good because it can have issues with the brushes and other things that this will not show you if you've got any other kind of a problem. You, have a, you can have a wide open uh, rotor so that there, it won't even build a magnetic field. But this diode test that you're using, using a diode test function on your meter, will not reveal something like an open rotor. So that is, if it fails this test, then that means you can go ahead and replace the alternator and you have a good reason to do so. If it passes the test, you may need to keep checking because you may still have issues with the alternator. All right, the fan test. Does the fan come on when it's supposed to? Look up the spec. It's a good idea to do that because... Like on that one Chevrolet Cavalier that I was looking up the spec on, I was surprised that the fan didn't come on until 228. It wasn't supposed to come on until 228. Watch your scan tool, monitor fan operation, but you don't even have to crank the, well, on a lot of them you have to crank the engine before the fan will even attempt to come on, so you might have to 
you know, crank it and have your potentiometer connected. And then you can dial in the potentiometer. You can buy one of those for like a dollar if you go to the right place online. Get the one with a 50,000 ohm, hook it up to just two of these, and turn that knob and watch your scan tool numbers. Dial in the temperature the fan has got to come. There's a window usually in which the fan will come on and go off, and it won't be an instantaneous coming on and going off, but what it will do is you can actually play with that and you can make sure that the fan will come on and go off at the temperatures when it's supposed to. Realize there may be a waiting period after you dial it back for, for the fan to go off. It may be 30, 45 seconds and then the fan will shut down. That's kind of like a daytime running lights. You know, they don't instantly change states whenever you go in and out of the shop and all that with the, for that electric eye to see the sunlight. All right. This other fan test using a series, uh, losing its light in series with the motor. You can also hit a test light into the terminal that's going out to the fan and do this by just pulling the fan relay. But you got to make sure you know which terminal's which. Can't just pick any terminal you want to. You got to pick the one going to the fan. It's going to read a ground coming through the fan, and you're going to be able to turn the fan through and see if the fan turns the, if the light goes off. I've got several videos on my channel about. It fan test. If you want to do a search on my YouTube channel for fan tests, you can see where we've done this and how we did it. But this is a go-no-go -go test. When I was at the dealership, people would come in there and I've devised this test myself. I don't know if anybody else has used this test unless I told them or they come up with it on their own. But people would come in there and they'd say, you know, my car tries to overheat and I hear a noise under the hood and a bunch of steam comes out from under the hood. What they were hearing was their pop-off valve on their AC compressor would go off and they'd see refrigerant spraying out of the air because the fan wasn't working. Well, you pull it in your service bay and it click off and on and off and on and off and on and off and on. You what's wrong with these people? I don't see anything wrong with this. Well, as soon as they leave out of the service area, they get down to their favorite stop sign and all of a sudden it's doing it again. So what I said, well, I got the reasoning in my mind. I said, this thing ought to carry uh, juice all the way through. So I would hook a test light up in series with a fan, turn the fan. If that test light ever goes off, and that's like roulette. If it stops on that dark spot, that fan will not kick on. That is a go-no-go -go test. If that light ever goes off while you're turning that fan through, you can replace that fan. You may have other problems, but you know for a fact you're going to have to have a fan. All right, you can test a fuel pump the same way. If it doesn't light the light, in other words, you're going to basically go to your pump output terminal. And there, this is a, basically how the pump's wired up from ground to that terminal right there. So when the power comes in here, you know, you got power and ground of these two, and it clicks this power into that uh, normally open, it's going to run the pump. Well, if I go right here from ground with my test light to here, then this ground ought to be feeding all the way through here, and it'll burn my test light. Now, this is with the pump at rest. The pump is not running here. Uh, if the light comes on, you're done. If it doesn't come on, you can kick the gas tank and see if it lights up. If it lights up after you kick the gas tank, or you just, you know, you pretty much 99% of the time you got a pump. We did kick the gas tank once and seen the light come on, and it was because there was some corrosion on a connector, but that's not usually the case. Scoping the fuel pump with an inductive current probe is also a good no-go if it fails. You know, a good pump will look like that, a bad pump will look like that. You can catch a bad pump early if you're really particular and you use this method. All right, so use a multiplier, and I'm going to show you what that means in just a minute for a good sample, and you do it this way. Now, this right here will basically give you a pattern, but it won't give you the, the amplification of the pattern that you need. And so basically what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to wrap a wire several times around and run the pump through this. In other words, go from here to here so that the pump current is going through this wire, and if it makes several wraps, it's going to make this pattern more pronounced using your little... Uh, amp probe, and the pump will run with the trunk with the current traveling through the wire loop, and the scope will pick it up, and then you wind up with that right there. You can also measure it if you've got an inductive current uh, meter. You know you can actually read how many amps the current's pulling too. Uh, excuse me, uh, how many amps the pump is pulling. If the pump is only pulling one and a half amps, it typically means you're out of gas. If it's pulling four to eight amps, it means it's pumping fuel. All right. Now, you've got to know how it works and how it's wired. Granted, what I was talking about will only work if you don't have a fuel pump module in the loop, right? Okay, so this relay right here on this one 
See, the, the fuel pump module is actually reading pressure from the rail and is, right, is uh, changing the current feed to the pump to regulate the fuel pressure. You see that? This is another little interesting thing. If you, when you see these little shields around the wires going to the pump, the reason that is not to keep the interference out of these wires, it's to keep interference in because there will be interference trying to get out of those wires and confuse other circuits. So that's when you see a pump set up like this with a shielded wire, uh, rather than keeping interference out, it's keeping it in. So just keep that in mind, that's how those pumps work. Now here's a simple example. Turn the key is supposed to start the car but nothing happens. What piece of information do we need to gather next? Do we hear a clicking noise from the starter with no operation? We notice the instrument cluster lights are very weak. Okay, we've already gathered two pieces of data here. So what are we going to do with these two pieces of data? Now the clicking noise from the starter at the very least means there is a signal making it through the neutral safety switch or the relay or whatever making it to the starter if the starter clicks. However, we're also noticing this. This is another piece of information we notice visually. These lights don't come on. They either come on bright and then they go dim or they just aren't very strong at all. Sometimes we turn on the headlights and see how bright they are just for the heck of it. What are your thoughts? First possibility, second possibility. This is how we have to think. We have to analyze this information and say, what could this mean? All right, is it a dead battery? Is it a bad connection somewhere? Where do we start? Okay, so obviously anytime you're doing any kind of electrical test, you're wanting to make sure that you have a good, strong battery and good, strong connection. That's the foundation for the house. If you don't fix the foundation, there's no use of working on any other part of the house. So. Make sure your battery is good and strong. Use it whatever tools you have necessary. If you have to pull the battery out and carry it to the parts store, let them check it. You know, then make sure that you find out that battery is good and that you have good, clean, solid connections. And if you have a bad connection somewhere, that's part of this. And so uh, where are you going to start on that? All right, if it looks like this, you're obviously going to have to do something with this. Now, what I usually like to do with this kind of nonsense right here and I like to go to the car wash, and you know where you have your uh, your wand, you know where it does. And I like to take some of this CRC battery cleaner, and that stuff right there really cuts this really good. You can also use baking soda water and this kind of stuff. Everybody knows that. Anyway, I use the CRC battery, and I clean the whole top of the battery because whenever you've got this kind of wetness on top of the battery, it can actually current can travel through there. Surface drain is what they call that. But I wash those off really good, and I examine them to see if they need to be replaced with the new solder on terminal. Okay. All right. So, battery checks out fine after charging. Terminal's cleaned and reinstalled. Charging system tested. Result, 12.3 volts and dropping. Okay. So, you've got the engine running, and you're watching your voltage, and you're, you can actually have your little cheap voltmeter hooked up to your battery and test that. And with the engine running, uh, you see the voltage at 12.3, and then at 12.2, and then 12.1 while the engine's running. That typically means you've got alternator issues right here. What's normal charge voltage? About 14.5 volts is typically what you're supposed to have for normal charge voltage. All right. Now, the next step is, if the battery charge lights on and the wire's connected to the alternator, is there strong 12 volt power at big alternator? So you want strong power here, because sometimes there will be a fuse in here on some of the newer cars. You want to make sure that this is connected, and your ignition switch is basically going to fire up the charge light. It's going to turn on the voltage regulator if it's got an internal regulator, and you know, of course, you this is going to be grounded here. So if you don't have good hot power here, you better find out why, right? And you got to make sure that the charge light power, you know, whatever you switch it on, is going through there. A lot of times these alternators won't have anything except a big terminal and this one light. I mean, one one right, that wire right here. If there's not any voltage at that one wire right there, that alternator's not going to put out. This is a sense wire if it's got an internal regulator, so it, it's a, it actually feeds the brushes and then the regulator dithers the ground to the other side of the brushes. I mean, it's the opposite on some of your tractor alternators, but we ain't working on tractors here. If all this checks out, it's probably the alternator, replace and retest. But if that charge light's not burning and that wire's cut, then it's not going to charge because there's no 12 volts getting to here. If you take your test light and hook it to hot and you touch it to here and it starts charging, 
you know there's a charge light issue. Now this charge light in the dash has got a little resistor that's wired parallel with it so that even if the light bulb blows, that little resistor will still feed that little whisper of voltage to here. But if it stops putting out and, and that stator is supposed to be putting out 7 volts on each leg and it basically is, is monitoring that, if, you, if it doesn't see voltage coming out of that stator, it will ground this and turn on the light, you know, as long as the key's on. And so anyway, there's a, there's a little, this is not really about alternators per se, but I just, you know, get started on that. I don't know when to shut up. To find that truth, the detective investigator must gather and analyze data in a way that their investigation leads them to that truth in all its reality, and it's easy to miss things. Here's the data. No crank verified. Weak voltage verified. Battery cleaned and tested. Okay, check alternator connections. Okay, this really should be up here. But you're basically going here to verify that you've got a no crank problem because sometimes they'll say it wouldn't crank and you try it and it does crank. You know, that's annoying because you've got to maybe have an intermittent. Check alternator connections. Okay. Conclusion is replace alternator and retest. It was kind of funny one time I had to, I got sent over to the local, that was a place, uh, one of those uh, temporary services places where this lady had an explorer <laughs> and it was, Sometimes it wouldn't start, and so she had caught it in the act, and they sent me over there with a test light, and I get up under there, and I'm going into that wire that's feeding the starter, and I said, check it and see, you know, if you've got any, you know, turn it to the start position, and she did, and there was no power, and I found problems with a wire or a connector or something, I can't remember. Well, this guy come walking out while I was under there working on it, he said, if you'd have bought a Toyota or a Nissan, you wouldn't be having this problem. I said, look here, buddy, I drive a Nissan, and I have to work on it, too. And that Nissan I drove, it only had 50,000 miles when I started driving it. That car gave me more trouble than any car I've ever drove in my whole life. But anyway, if the investigator does not gather enough data in the right way, then any repair performed may be done right, but still not fix the problem. How many times have you seen somebody that went out of their way to make sure they made their repair exactly the right way, but it turned out that repair wasn't what was needed? You know, sometimes you'll have a fastidious person misfires on their diagnosis and they know how to change parts. A lot of people change parts because that's all they know how to do. And they can change a part as good as anybody, but if the part they're changing is not the right part, then you've got issues. If there was a problem with the wiring, the alternator and the battery might be replaced unnecessarily. How many times have you seen that happen? When an investigator or researcher comes to a false conclusion by not gathering enough data before attempting a repair, that person has made what I like to call a type 1 error. Shotgun troubleshooting can be expensive. In other words, if you gather, a, if you come to a false conclusion because you didn't go far enough for your diagnosis, that's what I'm talking about there. All right. In this case, the truth remains undiscovered and the investigation has failed and more work needs to be done. It's best to go as far as you can. Now, the annoying thing about this is, particularly with these electronic boxes, you can actually go out of your way to try to make sure you cover all your bases and you can trace it down to the fact that we're sure that's got to be something in this black box here because it's got power, it's got grounds, and there, but there's so many wires, so many inputs, so many outputs. I'll give you a little bit of an example here of how you can misfire, and I've misfired on this what would seem like a very simple one. And it was a Ford Tempo, I think. Of course, there were two of these vehicles that gave the same problem within the same week, and I never saw it before or since. That's amazing how that works, isn't it? But the windshield wipers, instead of going like that, it would act like it was struggling, and then it would break loose and go up, and then it would act like it was struggling, and it would break loose and go up. I looked at the wiring schematic, and the high and on high was when it would do this, and I noticed that the high speed on the wipers bypass the wiper governor, which the wiper governor is what gives you your intermittent wipers, right? And so I said, well, if it's doing it on high and high bypasses the wiper governor, how can it be anything but the wiper governor? No, I'm sorry. I said, how can it be anything but the motor? Because it bypassed the governor, right? I'm thinking in my mind, I'm looking at the schematic, there's nothing in any special service messages or anything, no technical service bulletins. All I've got is me the vehicle, and this symptom, and I'm looking at a schematic trying to figure out if high has got nothing to do with the wiper governor, it's got to be the wiper motor somehow, maybe with the park switch issue or something like that. And so I ordered a wiper motor, 
And then whenever that didn't fix it, you know, I, and I saw two of them. I saw one on a Tempo, ordered a wiper motor for both of them because they were had exactly the same symptom. Uh, but it turned out it was the wiper governor. So when I got the wiper governor and changed it out on the truck, it fixed it. And I says, well, I'm not going to need the wiper motor for this other one because it hadn't come in yet. I said, give me a wiper governor for this one here. And then the parts guy he was grousing saying, oh, you ordered the wrong parts. You should have checked this closer and all that kind of thing. Well, sometimes, no matter how hard you try and no matter how well you can read a wiring schematic, there are some of the rules that just seem to elude you. You know what I mean? You, as hard as you may be trying, you know, the armchair quarterback, the parts guy sitting behind the counter, and I really like my good parts guys. You can't hardly operate if you ain't got good parts guys. I'm terrified if I have to talk to a parts guy that I don't know. You know, I like a parts guy that I know so that he, I like to know what to expect. I like to know what he's going to do. And I like to know that when I ask my parts guy for parts, that he's going to say, I'll find it for you. And I've had parts men that were really, really good at finding just any parts you needed, no matter what it was. And I've had some of them that just throw their hands up and say, well, I don't know, you had to get that somewhere else, I guess. That was always very annoying because you're wanting to buy parts, you know. Anyway, more work needs to be done. Now, anybody that claims they haven't made a Type 1 error is not being truthful. This was a 2007 Buick, hard, hot, hard, no start issue. We verified the fuel pressure, it remained solid. We found out when it wasn't starting, there was no fuel injection, no spark, but the crank sensor signal was consistent. So we always had a great, good crank sensor signal. But we found when we lost spark and injection, we also lost cam signal. This will always be the case on every vehicle. That's why you got to be careful about that. Some of them can lose the cam signal, like a lot of Fords can lose the cam signal and never lose fuel injection or ignition. Um, you know, may have lousy gas mileage because of bank fire and injectors or something. But that's what we ran into here. All right. So what you're looking at is you're looking at basically uh, this right here is your fuel injection, right? That's your ignition. All right. Look, when the cam went away, in other words, everything was normal here. This was when it was a normal start and run, right? Fuel injection, spark with the coil trigger, and here's your crank. And there's your chem sensor. However, spinning it over when it wouldn't start, we had no fuel injection, we had no ignition pulse, but we also had no chem sensor. Okay? And we found that on the scope. That's what we were looking at. So we wanted to verify the repair by warming it up six or seven times, shutting it off, restarting it. It would exhibit the no start every time this way, even if briefly before. On this round of tests, it started normally every time. There was no time that day for a long test drive. Uh, TJ took it for a drive park and the no start happened again. That's where we are now. All right. Based on this scope capture, we know our cam sensor, our ignition, our fuel injection are all gone at the same time. See, that's really important to be able to gather that information. We say, always had this now. You know, and this right here is important too, but in this case it never went anywhere. <coughs> all right. So what are the possibilities and what did we miss? This is your Hall effect sensor here. And that's another Hall Effect sensor. It's a, it's a crank position. There's your cam position. There's your ignition module right there with that little pulse right here. And here's your injector, right? Now that's basically coming out of the engine controller here and all that. So uh, what we wound up with on that one, and I actually had a picture of it in a previous one, was we had the cam sensor wire that was touching the balancer, but it wouldn't do it all the time. As, it, as it, it would, the heat would come and go, that little tiny place where the copper was exposed would touch the balancer, and when it touched the balancer, it was really, really hard to start that thing. And we wound up fixing the wires and tying them back and all that. I showed you a picture of that a couple of weeks ago in the same car. I didn't get that deep into the diagnosis on it, though. But to reject the truth and believe something else is a type 2 error. In other words, when you have found what you know the problem is, or what you didn't think the problem was, and you reject it for whatever reason, like, for example, this guy came one time, back when the, those old Tempos used to have those little $140 idle speed control motors, you know, where it would go re -re 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 out, and it had a little idle tracking switch in it. And uh, Every time I had one, it was doing crazy stuff at idle and all. I would basically buy, I'd check my, use my meter and I'd check the resistance of that idle tracking switch. And it ought to be a dead, a dead short whenever you had your you know foot on the gas and the switch was closed. It was in, the switch was inside this ISC motor, too, because you could replace it. And so this guy came up here and he said, can we you help me look at this? So I looked at it and I 
had seen the symptom before and I measured the continuity of that idle tracking switch and it was bouncing around between 20 and 90 ohms, you know, just floating all over the place. I said, you're going to have one of these before you do anything else. He said, my goodness, that's $140. Can we look somewhere else for the problem? This guy was used to fixing cars with points and plugs. And I asked him, I said, whenever you found one that had burned up points, did you close the distributor back up and go looking for a problem? No, I put points on it. And I said, that's where you are now. We know this is bad. Whatever else might be bad, we don't know. That's why you verify the repair. You replace the part you know is bad, and then you go and make sure it's fixed. Now, service riders didn't like that. If you went and told the service rider, because they were actually the line of uh, communication with the customer, you went and told the service rider. The service rider wanted to say, oh, yes, this is the only part you're ever going to need, and you'll never have another problem. You won't even ever need another oil change. They wanted to be the hero. So they'd come out there, and you'd say, well, I know it needs this, and I know it needs that. But until I replace these parts, I haven't, and I haven't verified the repair, I can't tell you if it's going to need something else. Well, they absolutely didn't like that. And they would actually, you know, said they want you to guarantee that this one repair you were making was going to fix this thing. And if it didn't, they basically wanted to try to figure out a way to pin it on you and make sure it make it look like it was your own fault. You know? But anyway, we might try to do this when a vehicle we worked on comes back because we did something wrong or didn't do everything right. That happens sometimes. We miss something. Maybe we left something loose. You know, not very professional to do that. But anybody that hadn't made a mistake like that is not being truthful, in my opinion. If we miss something and it happens, everybody. It's always best to avoid these errors and give the customer the benefit of the doubt from the outset until you find out what really happened. It's a whole lot better to go out there when your customer comes back and say, hey, you know, uh, this is not fixed or I'm having this problem again. You say, well, let me look and see if there's something I missed. That's a whole lot easier to deal with than if you go out there acting really stupid and say, oh, you know, there's no way I ever made a mistake, you know, and then you find out you did make a mistake, you got an got egg on your face. All right. This is a pan gasket story. This was my son's vehicle. They, this pan gasket was replaced because they thought it was leaking oil, but the oil was actually leaking from the oil pump, and it ran down here and it dripped off the pan, and they assumed the pan was leaking because that's where the oil was dripping from. They put a pan gasket on it, and they charged him 400 bucks. And so whenever he brought it over, he said he was still losing about a quart of oil every 100 miles because it was leaking around that uh, oil pump opening. And the point of leak was, you know, right there. And so what we did was we went ahead and uh, did a this, and I took this picture and sent it over there in the shop that he had it done in that other town when he had given him his money back for his pan gasket because they hadn't done it wrong and all that. But that was a type one error. The oil was running down and dripping off the pan when the wrong conclusion was reached. There was another one where these people were saying, remain seal, remain seal, remain seal uh, on this uh, Dodge Stratus. And it turned out that when we put dye in it, it was kind of from under the head gasket. And a lot of the times what the shops will do then is they'll say, well, we put the rear main seal on it, but it's still leaking. And now we're going to put a head gasket on it. We didn't see that leak until after we got the other one fixed. But it's a whole lot better off to uh, wash that thing off and put some dye on there and then see where the dye is coming from. You know, just uh, you need to do what you can. All the leaks are annoying because sometimes they're aggravating to the final because there's oil everywhere. And, you know, we use large quantities of brake parts cleaner to wash all that nonsense off. Just spray your, I told you this in the previous video, spray Dr. Scholl's foot powder on it and just paint it white and see where that oil starts showing up. That's a good way to do that. All right, there's paid researchers in today's academic scientific community that aren't really looking for the truth. They reject anything that doesn't line up with what they already believe. And they're interested in discovering what they're paid by other people to prove. Enough said about that. Avoid type 2 errors. In the business of troubleshooting, type 1 errors are bound to happen even on what seems like simple repair. We can be careful gathering our data and avoid this kind of error. I did the fuel pump test one time on a Taurus and I had seen pump after pump after pump after pump fail on a Taurus. Well, finally, I ran into one that when I checked that ground, it wasn't there and I found out that the ground ran all the way from the back, hooked up to the battery, and these battery terminals were chalky. And I could have fixed chalky battery terminals, and the pump would have come online. So that was just a really easy mistake to make. When we do experience a type 1 error, we ought to be prepared to admit it and do what we can to deal fairly with it. And sometimes it may be costly, but a good name is difficult to earn and easy to lose. What's wrong with this picture? That's interesting, isn't it? My buddy sent me this picture right here, took the valve cover off. Somebody it seemed like kept floating valves until that thing hammered its way through the <laughs> rocker arm. I don't know. But uh, 
Then there's plain old errors and dirty deals, like sloppy work, you know, included in this category. I had this one guy that was working at a dealership, it was a new car guy, there was a rattle in the exhaust on his Jeep and he put a piece of wood in there. <laughs> he said, well, it didn't rattle anymore, but that's not the way you fix a brand new vehicle, you know. All right, plain old errors, leaving screws out. How many times you put something back together and you had screws left, you know? Uh, this, this bunch of screws right here, came out of one vehicle we took apart to replace the instrument. But seems to me like I took that picture of the screws I pulled out of a Ford probe uh, when I was pulling the instrument cluster out of it. I mean, a lot of screws to pull out of there. Um, whenever you're changing spark plugs, they can be devilishly tough if you've got these 666 spark plugs here. But anyway, if you put a little, uh, if you don't know if that spark plug's going all the way down, like if you think the threads might be damaged, Put you a little Prussian blue. You can buy this at a parts store. It's made by Promatex. Put it on there, tie it down, make sure that you're getting good contact all the way around. That's very useful stuff. All right. Don't ignore important stuff. If you see a problem like this and they got some kind of battery issue or something that can be electrically related, this needs to be fixed before you go any further. Know your stuff. Avoid errors of all kinds if whenever possible. Don't be a second-rate amateur. And don't make it up as you go when you're talking to a customer because they can sense that. They can tell when you're feeding them a line. And that's the end of the slideshow today. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope you got something out of it. And I'll be talking to you all next week.